Okay, so what can we do about all the small space junk, which is the most dangerous bits? I mean, if we get rid of the big ones, that's going to not create any more small stuff. But there's still an awful lot of small stuff out there. And if you have any more big space explosions or a space war or something, it could be easily that there's an impenetrable layer of small stuff in space, which we need to get rid of without launching anything. Exactly. So this ends up being an interesting trick. And so people are turning to the idea of a laser. So this is the similar concept of the laser that we were using to track the debris. If we have something small enough um, and a wavelength that is now much smaller than, say, radar, we could, in theory, use the laser itself to move the debris. Now, we're not talking about disintegrating it. This isn't quite Star Wars, right? Yeah, now that would be cool. You just <laughs> blow the space junk, zap, 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 zap. But the amount of energy involved in that is prohibitive. And also, these are quite shiny, so the laser light will just bounce off rather than actually vaporizing things. Exactly. So what we actually want to do is to let the Earth's atmosphere do the trick. So instead of the idea where we have a controlled satellite or rocket booster that we deorbit the Earth's atmosphere, well, can we artificially cause a piece of junk to do it for us. So we have our piece of junk orbiting around us. Now we say, all right, we know where the junk is. We know what we want to do with it. Let's fire our laser so that we give it a little bit of a nudge into the Earth's atmosphere. OK. So we make it a little bit more eccentric. So we make it a little bit more angled, mm -hmm. become a little bit more down. And so you would use the laser to ablate the surface. And it doesn't matter how big it is, but you kind of change and alter a little bit of the surface, changes the drag, and therefore then we in theory can have this laser slightly re-steering this object into space. Now it's not going to nosedive it, but if you do it a few times, if you give it a nudge, and then give it a nudge again, yep. and then a third nudge, it may burn up. I mean, this is going tens of thousands of kilometers every day. So if you're going at 10,000 kilometers and you change your direction very slightly, you end up in a very different place from where you would otherwise have started. Exactly. Even a very tiny change in direction over enough orbits could have a big effect. That's right. And because this is really small stuff, you don't need that much atmospheric drag or skimming to burn it up. You're not talking about trying to burn up an entire rocket booster. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to burn up a piece of paint, it's going to be a lot easier to do this. But how do you actually do this with the laser, Paul? Yeah, but we think lasers, you know, death rays, they... Um, when the lasers were first invented, people thought, you know, this is great for cutting up James Bond or whatever it might be. <laughs> uh, it turns out lasers are actually not very good at doing that. I mean, they can use to cut fabrics and metals and so on, but they're not... That's not over a distance of a millimetre, not over a distance of thousands of kilometres. That's right. The laser is generally too spread out to do anything much up there. Exactly. But there are kind of two ways in which you can move things. One is that light actually has pressure. Yep. The light from the lamps in this room is hitting us, and it actually is applying a bit of force to us. Now, that force is very, very small. I don't feel, oh, the sun has risen, I've been knocked over by the sunlight. Um, but nonetheless, it is there, and it is measurable with sensitive laboratory equipment. And again, you don't need a lot of force to deorbit a small piece of space junk. That's right. There's not a lot of force up there, and there's not a lot of mass to it. So even the slightest nudge actually does a lot. So that's one possibility. You're just actually using the pressure of the laser light. Another possibility is that you are, in fact, zapping this thing, and you're causing not the whole thing to disintegrate, but maybe some outer layer to burn off. Yep. And as the outer layer might be vaporized, and the, so let's say you've got a, a space junk here and you hit it with a laser, and this side starts vaporizing and the gas puffs off, that gas puffing off is acting like a rocket and pushing it the other direction. And so that's what you were talking about, ablating, which that's is right. like burning off outer layers. The layer might be very thin, but as that gas burns off, it pushes what's left over, hopefully into a different and shorter lived <laughs> orbit. And so this is the thing, we're talking about very small effects, but we're also only talking about very small junk. And so if we can do this enough times on enough bits of it, maybe we can solve this problem. Now, practically, though, we need an awful lot of these lasers to be operating to do this because there's an awful lot of junk, right? Here in, in Canberra, we can't see the junk in the far ports of the Northern Hemisphere, so we have to build up one up there. And we also have to know the position well enough to be able to do this. We're not just randomly firing lasers into space. Well, I guess we could, but... Um, but you, you need to track the piece right. of junk. So there's presumably going to be a lot of computer intelligence involved in keeping track of... Because at this side, there are only tens to hundreds of thousands of these things up there. Yep. And you need to, first of all, find out where they are, whether it's with radar or with actually with some sort of laser measurement of where they are. Yep. And then you have to say, OK, these ones could be deorbited if you hit them at this time with this much force. 
and presumably you want to do experiments and find it because you don't, don't quite know how much is going to a blade because often you don't know what these things are actually made exactly, out of. Exactly, that's right. I Hitting mean, a piece of paint versus a screw is going to be very different. So all of these things really factor into this, the ability to do this. Now, it, does, it is becoming a proven ability as we're about to go see, but this whole space junk problem is really interesting in some ways because we love our satellites, we want more of them, but with it comes this really big baggage that I think most people don't realize, right, Paul? That's right. So, uh, law of unintended consequences. If you make space travel cheap and easy, that means it's going to make space junk cheap and easy to produce. It's like the invention of plastics. Yep. Wonder materials. I mean, if you managed to transport your plastics back to medieval time, people would have thought this is you know, more <laughs> valuable than gold. This is so wonderful. But it doesn't go away. Exactly. So the space junk problem is one that is here. Hopefully we can limit producing more and hopefully we can get a control of it so that we can still access that cheap and easy space.